Good evening, my beloved. It is so good to be back with you again this week as we are continuing in our Advent series. And I hope you've enjoyed the lesson so far. We have uh, addressed hope and peace and joy. And tonight we're going to talk about love, specifically the love of God and how important it is for us to remember the love of God because it will carry us in all kinds of situations when we remember how important love is, the love of God in particular. So that's our area that we're going to be dealing with tonight. And I hope that you are get your Bibles ready because we will go through several scriptures and I want you to be able to go along with me in those doing those scriptures so that we'll get a fuller understanding of our lesson tonight. Uh, and we're going to title it Because of Love. That's what we're just going to call it, Because of Love. But it's really about love. So we're going to start with prayer as always. Father God, again, we come before you to say thank you, Lord. You're an awful, awesome God. You're more than enough. You're all sufficient. You're everything that we need. You're our wheel in the middle of a wheel. You're our, top, our bridge over troubled waters. You're bread when we're hungry. God, you're just all that we need. So we thank you, Lord, for being the loving and kind God that you are for having so much patience with us, Lord, just loving us in spite of us. So we can never say enough, God how much we love you, how much we honor you, and give you glory. So tonight, Lord, for the purpose of this message, we are talking about the love of God. I pray that this message will go through with clarity so we will all fully understand and for some be introduced to some to just be reminded of the love of God and how you love us continually on a daily basis. So again, we thank you, Lord, and we ask you, Holy Spirit, to speak through us, help us to do this lesson with clarity so that those who are in attendance will understand fully the utmost importance of the love of God in our lives. We thank you and we praise you, and may you get the glory by what transpires here tonight. This is our prayer, we pray, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so again, we're in our last well, next to the last lesson in our Advent, and we know, of course, that Advent is a, a time when Advent means uh, arrival or coming, and we're in a season of Advent now. It begins the last Sunday in November, and it continues through uh, Christmas morning or for new Christmas Eve, whichever you determine by your calendar, and it tells about the hope that the Israelites had when they were waiting for a Messiah. And that the symbolism of it is the reef is, uh, has no beginning and no ending, which symbolizes uh, the God, our creator. And the candles depict the light that's brought to us by Jesus Christ. And the, the color is purple, which talks about sacrifice and royalty all mixed together. So that's all a part of the symbolism of Advent. But we're in the season of Advent, which I said before means coming or arrival. And we celebrate it today for two reasons, which is where our lesson, and by the way, our lesson will come from Hebrews chapter 2, the first part, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. So get your Bibles and go to Hebrews chapter 2. And so uh, there's two reasons why we celebrate Advent today. In respect to the Old Testament saints who, in their anticipation and hope, waited for the first Advent. That's why we celebrate. Secondly, we celebrate that even though we've already experienced the first advent, we are similarly, similarly waiting for him to come again. And we are anticipating his second advent. And so in our text today, uh, well, in, our, in the Bible, actually, the prophet Isaiah told the Israelites that who, this, who the Messiah would be. They were waiting and anticipating for the Messiah to come. So Isaiah told them who he would be and what he would do. Now, the writers of Hebrews remind us, those of us today, that while we wait, that he tells us who he is and what he is, what he's already done during his first advent. We're living in those days now. And because we are the beneficiaries of his first advent, today we will reflect on one of the components of advent, which is the unfathomable love of God. You cannot get away from the love of God. And so a few years ago, one of my favorite singers, Miss Tina Turner, had a song called What's Love Got to Do With It? And it was very rhythmic and everybody liked it and danced to it and everything. Uh, but the kind of love she sang about uh, can never compare to the love of God. Amen. Not to put Miss Tina down, but we're talking here tonight about the love of God. And so in today's message, we find that 
we can celebrate the love of God for us that was demonstrated through the sacrificial death and vicarious sufferings of Jesus Christ. So let's go to our text and understand where we are. And it says, uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. And it reads thusly, and I'm reading from the New King James. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he made by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him for whom all things are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of that salvation perfect through sufferings. So uh, Hebrews writing is saying what Jesus did. But then you go back to uh, the first verse in Hebrews chapter 2. It says, therefore, we must give the more honest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. And so that's what our lesson is going to focus on tonight, is remembering what Christ did. Remembering how he showed his love to us. Remembering the sacrificial death that he experienced because of his love for us. And so Jesus was incarnated in the form of, of mankind. Uh, he became a living sacrifice for us. And we'll find that on Philippians 2, 8, which says, he took upon himself the form of a servant, and as such he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Now, we all know that it's not every day that someone will die for people uh, that they don't know. Bible says scarcely will a man die for a friend, but Jesus Christ died for all of us. Amen? And so, um, and even those who don't know him yet, he still died for them. He died for everybody. And so, and this death is what the Hebrew writer is wanting us to remember. He wants us to remember uh, all of, the, all of the, the, the facets of this death. And it was no ordinary death. Verse 10, in the same text, it says that for it was fitting for him for whom all things, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of that salvation perfect through the sufferings. So what he's saying is that Jesus Christ suffered for us. He died for us, and it was all because of love. And like I said, that was no ordinary death. Before Christ, before Christ's first advent, Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah wrote in his book in chapter 9, he talked about him coming, and he was going to be the prince of peace, a, uh, a counselor and all that. But when you, if you keep reading in Isaiah and you get to chapter 53, this is what Isaiah told us about the suffering that he would do because of his love for us. And Isaiah 53 and 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. That's the suffering, and that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. We are not to forget that. We are to always remember the great extent to which Christ went through so that we could be here today. And then verse 53, I mean, chapter 53, verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so um, Christ's death wasn't pretty. But he did it because of us. And I like what the Living Bible says in 53, 10a. In the Living Bible, it says, uh, it was the Lord's good plan to bruise him and to fill him with grief. Now, grief in this text means physical pain and suffering. So it was because of the love of God, God's love for us, that he sent his son to Calvary. And still today, it's because of the love that God keeps, love, keeps loving us with that he forgives our sins. I want, to always, I want to get that a little bit in because many people live in bondage of unforgiveness. But God, Jesus Christ's death on Calvary, which we are to remember, he died so that we could be forgiven for our past sin. And so it's because of the, it's because of the love of God that we are able to look past our past mistakes and move on into the future with a clear conscience because God has forgiven you. Amen? And there was a song a few years ago uh, I think it was by the Williams brothers called Grace and Mercy. And it says, your grace and mercy brought me through. I'm living this moment because of you. And I want to thank you and praise you too for your grace and mercy brought me through. God wants us to remember that it was his grace and his mercy that we went through the trials we went through and we came out unscathed. 
there's a, a, a message I preached one time called, I don't look like what I've been through. And that's my testimony because I've been through some situations, but God brought me through. And had he not loved me as much as he loves me, he could have just walked away and said, you know what? You're on your own. But he was there all the time. And that's another song. He was there all the time. And so the love of God is evident in our lives every day. The fact that he woke you up this morning, that's the love of God. He carried you through wherever you're going from this morning to now, the love of God, okay? And so it's the love of God that keeps us and brings us through our trials. And uh, the, the writer, as I said in Hebrew, says, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away. So what he's saying is we'll get so wrapped up in stuff till we'll forget how we got here and the price that was paid for us. And when you see... Uh, we're going back to uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. You see that word, therefore? Well, therefore, when you see that, it means because of what you read in the previous chapter. Amen? And so, therefore, connects chapter 2 with chapter 1. And therefore, uh, in chapter 1, it talks about God is no longer speaking to us through power prophets, uh, but today he speaks to us through his son who came and purged our sins and is now sitting on the right hand of Father, being recognized by God himself as the Lord. And because you've already heard those things, when you get to verse 2, it says, therefore, don't forget that. So we're not to forget the price that was paid by God because of the love he had for us. And so we got to be diligent in focusing in on what we've had. Too often, we look at things, particularly in the Old Testament, and we say that's old and it doesn't apply to us. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Much of it was written for the Israelites, but the principles are there for us to live by today. So don't ever look at your Bible and feel like, I don't have a, 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 an interest in this because of when it happened. No, no, no. God gave us a whole word, not, a, not partial but a whole word. And so we got to be diligent and focusing in on what we've heard and learned regarding the love of God in Christ Jesus. And we have access to that, like I said, through his word. That's how we know what, he, what, he's, what, his, what his word says and what he does. And so we all know that what is considered to be the, one of the most popular verses in the Bible, John 3, 16. There's not many people who don't know John 3, 16. And John 3, 16 says... For God so loved the world. Now, that word so has emphasis. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Two things in there. God so loved the world, which emphasis is, is that he was so in love with us even at that time that he sent his son. And he gave his only begotten son that whosoever now, whosoever's are all of us. I'm a whosoever. If you believe in Christ, you're a whosoever. So there's so much in that scripture that describes the love of God. And this verse speaks of what God has done. It speaks of what he is doing. And he speaks of what he will do. And that to me says love. That says love all the way. This verse says that we were on God's mind even before he sent his son. We were on his mind. Hallelujah. And we're on his mind today because he's still offering us eternal life. That's love. That, not this love you hear in songs and, but I'm going to love you up and that, all that kind of crap. No, no, no. If you want to know real love, think in terms of the love that God uh, provided for us, the love that he showed us through the death of his son. And so, in the divine and complete word of God, we have the entirety of his love. Amen? And so we know that through Christ's uh, sacrificial death and his most importantly, his, re his resurrection, because if he had stayed dead, we'd still be in bad shape. But he didn't. And so the writer in Hebrews is saying, don't forget these things. When you think about love, think about what Christ did for us. Always remember that. Amen. And so the writer of our text reminds that we're in danger of forgetting because we get so busy with stuff, especially this time of the year when we're supposed to be celebrating the birth of Christ and we celebrate everything but that. But even in the midst of all that, it's up to us on a personal level. See, there's no blanket anything. God wants us to meet him on a personal basis. It's up to us 
to get into our word and to study our word and to know what God has done for us, what he's doing and what he will do. And we've been warned not to forget what Christ has done for us, not to neglect our salvation or take it for granted. It's important. Amen. And we can avoid this by spending time in the word. We spend it and just like um, I'm still talking about love in the real life. If you put gas in your tank, it only lasts for so long. And you have to go back to the, we call them, we call them service stations. I don't, we, that's what I call it. I don't know what you call it. You go back to the service station and you must put more gas in there or you can't use the car. That it won't run without gas. Well, the same thing applies to us in our relationship with God. We need to be refilled. We can't just have one serving on Sundays and think that service is going to carry us until the next Sunday. And that's why when you're driving in your car and a little light come on, say so you need more gas. That's why some of us, by the middle of the week, we burden down. We don't know what to think. We, 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 we're back in a, in a state of funk because we don't know anything. We don't know what's going to happen. That's because you need some feeling. You need to get into your word and allow the Lord to speak to you and give you that joy that we talked about last week to refill you. And God's word is fuel for our soul because it's, 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 it shows us and it fills us so that we can go that next, mile, that next mile. And unless we get a refill on God's words, we will be depleted. And so the, the writer in Hebrews says, therefore, we take heed that you don't forget that. And it's important for us, if you just think about your car, your car needs to be refilled. You can't go 200 miles on a tank of gas. At least most cars, you can't. You need to be refilled or put it, or it plugged up now since we got electric cars. Same principle. Amen. And so if we, got, we need to be diligent about getting into that word. And the word will show us over and over again how much God loves us. And you know what? We have an advantage these days over the Israelites. They were waiting for Christ to come. We are already in the place where he's already been. He's already been here. And God sent him to us. Let's turn in your Bibles to Galatians 4. Now, Galatians, you got to go back from Hebrews. Galatians 4, 4 through 7. And this is one of, one of a good scripture to keep in your mind, to understand that even though the Israelites were waiting for his first advent, he's already come, and we're waiting for him to come again. And this is how I know that God loves us because he sent his son. Listen what it says. Galatians 4, beginning at verse 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are currently... Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So we're in a pretty good place because God has already, he has already sent his son. And that word sent means that it's, it's a continuous thing. He didn't just send him and, 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 and he didn't do anything. He came with a purpose and a mission. And that mission was just like we just said, and because you, he says to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. So we've already been blessed to do and to have God in our lives. And how do you know this? How do you know that that's what you're supposed to be doing? Because you look at uh, uh, verse 7. When we go now, we're going to go now, first of all, to 1 John. I forgot to tell you that. We're going to go to 1 John chapter 4. Now, 1 John, not John, but 1 John. Amen? 1 John chapter 4. And 1 John comes after Peter. And you, if you go in there, okay, okay? And this is going to show you how we know about the love of God. Amen? Are we there? there? Are you there yet? Okay, 1 John 4, verses 7 through 11. And this is how it reads. It says, but let us, but not beloved, first of all, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. Mm. For God is love. In this, the love of God was manifest towards us. Here we go again. That God has, has past tense. 
don't, don't, don't misread, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we may live through him. And this love, not, not that we loved him, that, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, a big word, for our sins. And it says, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And so being born of God means that we have the capacity to love. And we're supposed to, just like God loves us, we're supposed to love each other. And being born of God means that God's divine nature is imparted in us as believers. And the belief in the divine nature is that God is love and he will, he will and he works. His will and his works are primarily of love. So love is natural and it's also essential. God showed us that example in, this, in the Bible. Amen. And so to know God is to love God. And then verse 9 says, in this, the love of God was manifested towards us that God has sent his son, his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Amen. And that's what we're celebrating during this Advent season, that God has already sent his son. Amen. And, and again, from if, when you're thinking about stuff, and I'm going to give you this little lesson in Greek for a second, uh, the grammatical construct in the Greek, in the New Testament, this word sent it means that it is a fact and that the action was completed in the past, but it has a continuing result. So that's what it means when you, when you, when you do it into the Greek, okay? And so we, and, and, and verse 9 says that we might live through him and we have life through him, but that life is the love of God. Amen? Amen. And so as we continue to go through this lesson, uh, we should never forget again that God loves us and that he will always, always, always love us. Amen. And there, there's a song that used to be sung. Uh, our choir, the church I pastor, used to do a cantata every Christmas. And one of the songs that they sang was uh, Love Came Down. And it, it, it's a beautiful song. Love Reaching, I'm sorry, what's the name of the song? Love Reaching. And the essence of the song is that God reached way down from heaven and sent his son, who named, whose name was Jesus, to deliver us and to give us what we need. And so this word sent, it just means that it's already happened. And Hebrew says, don't forget it. And it was done because of love. And then verse 11, we're almost ready to finish. It says, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. That's a command. And this verse uh, is it's a commandment to us and it relates to us and our will to love each other. And the question is, how can we reject people who God loves so much? How can, how can we do that? So the love of God should induce a universal love among mankind. The Bible says, if you say, go to verse 20, it's still in 1 John 4. It says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And so John makes it perfectly clear here that we are to love one another. And we can't say that we love God if we don't love our fellow man. Amen? And it's imperative uh, uh, in, 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 in our, that Jesus said that we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart and with all of our, our soul and with all of our mind. And it's, that's the first commandment. And the second one is likened to it, that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. And so God is telling us clearly that we're supposed to love one another. Love is the sum total of what God has done and what he shows us. Love was initiated by God. He saw our need and he met it. And we then, by our will, are to appropriate that love by loving one another. Amen? And so as we continue on, we want us to know uh, what does this love look like? What does the love of God look like in our lives? Well, the love of God means that we are free from the bondage of sin because along with purchasing our freedom, he purchased our pardon. Secondly, because of love, we have the privilege of forgiveness. We talked about that too, the privilege of forgiveness. And our sins remembered no more. And because of love, we have access to the Father. Because of love, we have today with the full use of our minds and our bodies, we can think. 
And because of love, we can weather any storm as long as Jesus is in our lives. And because of that love, we are protected from a lot of unseen hurts and harms that would harm us anyway, because there are ministering angels around us. The Bible tells us that. But more than all of that, we have the greatest gift that's ever been given to us, and that's the gift of God. So we're going to close because we're about ready to wrap this lesson up. So I will say to you, as we celebrate this season of Lent, uh, that this lesson has been about love, that God loved us first. And we saw in the word that says if we say we love God whom we haven't seen and we don't love our fellow man, that we're liars. So we want to keep that in mind. And remember, Hebrews told us, don't forget what Christ did. He initiated love. God is love. Amen. And so today in this season, we are to show love to each other. We're to show love. But the Bible teaches us not to limit love to a season. We don't just love folks during Christmas holidays. I know people think that people are more joyful and jubilant and things like that during the Christmas holidays. And there is a spirit that comes along with it. But love, love isn't seasonal. Love is forever. Amen? And that same love that we're expressing today should continue even after the trees go down and the decorations have been put away and the dinner has been eaten and your relatives that traveled have gone back home and all of this Christmas stuff is put away and your Christmas sales are put away to next year and everything. Love for Christians, for us, it's a way of life. And it doesn't depend on a season in the year. So whatever love you're experiencing now, keep experiencing that love. Keep loving people the way God loved us to the best of your ability. Love. Love him because God, when God sent his son, he didn't necessarily give us what we wanted. He gave us what we needed. And so we're to love each other that way. And so let us determine from this day forward to live that God kind of love. Because love is a part of this season. And God, the Bible says God is no respect of persons. He loves everybody. He doesn't hold our past against us. And his desire is that we will come to love him and each other with real love, not that phony kind, not that smile in your face kind and your heart ain't nowhere in it, but to love. And it's not that difficult to do, to love people. Amen. God wants us to have unconditional love. He doesn't want us to, I'm going to love you as long as you do what I want you to do. I'm going to love you as long as you are in my corner. But the minute something comes up, when I stand on my own and I, 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 I don't embrace everything you say, then all of, all of a sudden you're not on my list anymore. That's not love. Real love is unconditional. And one of the greatest examples of unconditional love, and I don't mean to, to, to dismiss dads, but one of the most important and examples of unconditional love is the love of a mother. Because you're going to love your child no matter what. And so that's the kind of love that God of, and it's a forgiving love. Don't hold grudges. Don't, don't feel like if you kick my dog, I'm going to kick your cat because you did me wrong. I'm going to do you wrong. That's not love. Real love says, I forgive you, and I give you another opportunity, just like God forgave me, because there's not a person in this world who has not experienced the forgiveness of God. And if he forgave us, we are to forgive one another. That's real love. And so, again, Hebrew says, don't, we're in danger of forgetting the real love. We're in danger of, of, of being so overwhelmed by things that we forget the love of God for us. And so we don't exercise that love towards one another. But God says to love each other. Amen. So that's our lesson for tonight on love. I hope you understood it fully and that you will do everything you can to remind yourself and to get a refill every week on the word of God so that you can continue to walk in the way God would have you to walk. Because if you're depending on a Sunday message by Wednesday, you probably don't even remember what the preacher preached about. But this is forever. You can always go here. It's kind of raggedy, but you can always go here and find out about the love of God and how important it is that we love one another. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you again for this opportunity to study your word and to get into your word and to show us, Lord, what real love looks like and to know the sacrifice that you 
put your son through for those of us who have accepted you. We, for everybody, Lord, not just those who have said yes, but even those who have not said yes, the opportunity is still there. So, God, I praise you and I thank you that you love us and you forgive us and you don't hold our past against us because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, that according to Romans. And so, God, we're all those whosoever that has accepted Christ and know the real value of loving God and knowing how much God loved us. For your word says that we move and breathe and have our being in him. So we thank you, Lord, for the awesome privilege of serving you and loving you and to be able to extend that same kind of God love to those who may be a little bit different from us. But God, you said that you're no respect of persons and we are not to judge. Help us, oh God, to learn how to love one another. And if we do, Lord, this world would be a better place. The people in the world would be better people if we love the way God loves us. Thank you for this awesome opportunity to get into your word, and may you be glorified by what we did tonight. This is our prayer we pray, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night.